Hello friends, good morning and welcome to worship at Lakewood Grace and Little Church on the Prairie. We are glad that you are joining with us today. A uh, couple of announcements. We want to invite you to prayer at 6.30. Uh, Pastor James hosts that on Zoom. So if you want to be part of that, fill out a communication card below, send it in and the link will be sent to you. And we want to let you know that beginning on September 6th, at both 9 a.m. and 11 a.m., we're going to start live streaming. So what this means is if you uh, would like to catch a live streamed uh, Little Church on the Prairie worship, you tune in at 9 a.m. If you want to catch a Lakewood Grace uh, live stream at 11, you tune in at 11 a.m. Now, the cool thing with both of those is both of those services will be recorded. So if you can't miss, if you can't make the 9 or 11 one, you have no excuse you can always watch it. And so we want to let you know that we're going to start doing that pretty soon. And we're getting our Lakewood Grace uh, studio set up and uh, things are happening here in the sanctuary to prepare for that. So a couple of fun things to look forward to and we want to let you know. All right, let's join our hearts together in a word of prayer as we begin our service today. Lord, we thank you for the chance to gather, even if it's like this. You are good and you are faithful even now, God. And we trust you. Lord, we begin our worship with a confession that we are sinners. And your word says that there are none who are good, not even one. And so we, we confess that to you, God, that we are sinners in need of a Savior. We realize, Lord, that it is complete folly to think that we can save ourselves through good wishes or good behavior God, what we need is a Savior, and we find that in Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, in the quiet of our hearts right now, we confess to you those sins that have broken our relationship, that have broken the relationships with others around us. Hear now our silent prayers of confession. Lord, our confession is always followed by the assurance of pardon. And so God, on, on one hand, we can declare that we are sinners in need of a Savior. And Lord, yet on the other, we can declare that because of what Jesus Christ has done on the cross, because of the resurrection, that as far as the east is from the west, you have removed our sins. And we thank you, Lord, that because of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done, our sins are no longer held against us. And you see us, Lord, as righteous people. And so, God, we thank you. We trust you. And we proclaim this day that our sins are forgiven. We love you. Help us forgive others as you have forgiven us. Thank you for your mercy. We pray these things now in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. And now... Kids, if you're watching, this is the time where you get closer to the TV because our children's ministry has something fantastic for you. So, take it away, ladies. Hey, everyone. I am here at the coffee cabin in Stillicum, and I am with Jillian, who's baking the morning treats. So, hi, Jillian. Thank you so much hey. for letting us come. Yeah, of course. Welcome. What are you baking today? I am making raspberry scones. Wow, what are some of the other things that you bake? We bake um, coffee cake, we bake brownies, muffins, cookies, more different types of scones, all sorts of treats. And what's your favorite? My favorite is the raspberry scone. It is real good. And why do you like baking? Um, I love baking because you get ingredients like flour, sugar, baking soda, baking powder, and you can create something like a scone out of just random things like flour. Well, I think I would like to try one of everything. The Bible talks a lot about food, especially bread. You might remember the Bible story about the time when Jesus was preaching to a huge crowd of people and they had nothing to eat. So a very generous little boy shared his lunch and Jesus took a little bit of bread and a few fishes and he made it into enough for 5,000 people. In fact, there were even leftovers. Well, there's more to that story. 
The next day, a crowd of people came looking for Jesus. They even rowed their boats across the Sea of Galilee to find him. And when they found him, they said, we've been looking everywhere for you. But Jesus knew that they weren't actually looking for him. They were looking for more miracles. And sure enough, they told Jesus that they would believe in him if he would do another miracle. And then they reminded him about how God had sent manna to the Israelites when they were in the wilderness. Wow. Jesus explained to them that they needed more than food for their stomachs. They needed food for their souls. And then he told them that he is the bread of life. The food that we eat and the things that we do don't really satisfy us. They leave us wanting more. Just like these bakery treats that taste so good, but if I eat one or even more than one, I'll still be hungry later. If we have Jesus, the bread of life, our hearts will be satisfied and it will be enough. God sent manna from heaven so that the Israelites would be able to live in the desert. God sent Jesus from heaven so that we would be able to live forever. If our stomachs are feeling hungry, we can get a snack or have a meal to fill us up. But what can we do if we're feeling hungry for Jesus? Well, we can read his word, we can talk to him, we can sing to him, we can remember what he's done for us and thank him, and he will fill our souls. Psalm 34, eight tells us, O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. Have a great week, kids. Peace be with you. Now 
darkness, my God, that is who you are. Even when I don't see it, you work it. Even when I don't feel it, you work it. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you work it. Stop, you never stop working You never stop, you never stop working Even when I don't see it, you're working Even when I don't feel it, you're working You never stop, you never stop working You never stop, you never stop working Even when I don't see it, you're working Even when I don't feel it, you're working You never stop Stop working, you never stop, no Good morning, little church in Lakewood Grace. It is so good to see you. Hey, before we begin our sermon this morning, uh, we're, I'd like to spend a few moments with you to talk about what, what are the plans for the little church in Lakewood Grace for the remainder of 2020. You know, when we uh, gathered to worship on the first Sunday of March, who knew then that that would be the last time we would be together as a church family in person for months? And when we entered into this season, the position we took was to wait and see. We said that we would wait and see, and we would get back together when it was safe for all our members to do so, and that was March. Without a question, we are living in an uncertain time. When will a vaccine for COVID-19 finally materialize? How many more Americans will die and get sick before there's an effective treatment or a cure for COVID-19? When will our kids go back to school in person? When will the economy start growing again and recovering? When will we start traveling again? There are so many uncertainties during this time. You know, Andy Stanley said something that I think is really important. He said, in times of uncertainty, Clarity will suffice. Leaders can be uncertain in uncertain times, but leaders cannot be, cannot afford to be unclear. 
In uncertain time, leaders can be uncertain. That's normal when no one knows with any certainty when things will start getting back to some semblance of normal. When uncertainty, while uncertainty is to be expected during uncertain times, what we cannot afford is to be unclear. So let me spend a few moments with you letting you know about the rest of the plans for 2020 for the little church on Lake with Grace. And we are not planning for the rest of the year to meet in person. We will continue to worship online like this. This time of uncertainty has not been good for us. Not knowing, wait, this, this time of wait and see has not been good for us. And so what we're going to do and what we have been doing as a staff in the last several months is instead of, instead of wait and see, we are asking instead, how do we engage given COVID-19 realities? How do we engage and how do we equip our saints to be fully alive and to be fully serving and engaging in ministry to make disciples, grow disciples, and share the love of Christ with all people right now? Because that's what Christ and God expects of the church. And so we want to maximize our given COVID realities and we want to maximize this time to help you to grow, help you to make an impact in this community. We are moving forward to engage you. We, don't, uh, we want to engage you. We don't want you sitting idly by anymore. We want you to get into action mode. We want to engage you in ministry to serve and to give and to make a difference given COVID-19 realities. Given we're not able to meet in large gatherings, we're asking instead, what can we do to help you to grow and mature in, in smaller gatherings? What can we do to help you fully maximize your kingdom service and potential right now with COVID realities? Now, this prolonged season of social isolation has not been healthy for anyone. So next week, you're going to hear how we have reorganized all our small group ministries into neighborhood groups. We want to encourage you to gather in neighborhood groups and to see each other face to face. And in fact, uh, for communion service and first Sunday of the month, we would love it if the neighborhood groups would get together with several families that you feel comfortable with and worship together and share communion together. But we want your, your face-to-face time in neighborhood gr- groups to be pretty regular. We want to see smaller-sized groups meet in person while practicing social distance uh, in settings that are safe to do so. We've got this fabulous yard, green space, and then should the weather, when the weather turns on us, uh, we've got Prairie Hall. And so we're going to be looking at ways of encouraging you to meet in smaller-sized groups to f- face-to-face to get that time together. So get ready, little church in Lakewood Grace, to re-engage in ministry and service. That's what we were created to be and to do, and we will continue to add to the kingdom those who are being saved and impacted by the ministry of Jesus Christ through little church in Lakewood Grace, even in the midst of COVID-19. And wasn't last week just tremendous, where we received eight new members In the midst of COVID-19, thank you for being such an amazing church. Now let's get to work. Join me in a word of prayer. Oh God, we thank you so much for the opportunity to worship you and to serve you. Lord, this has been a funky season for us in in terms of COVID-19 and social distancing. Man, who would have thought that this would be our world? And yet here we are, Lord, uh, we are making plans to make the most of our current realities. And so grant your leaders wisdom and help us to move forward as a congregation. We give you thanks in Jesus name. Amen. All right. The text for this morning uh, comes to us from first Peter chapter two verses 9 through 12, listen now to God's word to you and to me. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, 
a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hey, so in Peter, in this section of his letter, um, teaches this newly found church, this burgeoning church, this baby of a church that is undergoing massive persecution and stress, and the days are going to get worse. And so what he wants to do in this central section of the letter is that he wants to teach this baby church both the nature of the church and the function of the church. What is the nature of the church? Who is she? And the function. What is she supposed to be doing? And this is central to Peter's understanding of the church and what he wants to share with the church, this baby church. So this week, we're going to look at the nature of the church. Who is she? And then next week, we're going to look at the function of the church. What is she called to do? Now, the nature of the church, Christian Christianity, is first and foremost, Peter wants his people to know, first and foremost, Christianity is community. Look at the way he describes the church. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. All those are in the plural form. Those are plural forms of the people. There is no church of individuals. You can only have gathered, called out ones, which is literally ecclesia. That's what the church is, is the called out ones, plural. You cannot be a church in isolation. A church is community. Now, there's a famous story from Sparta. A Spartan king boasted to a visiting monarch about the walls of Sparta. And the visiting monarch looked around in confusion and said, you know, I don't see walls. Where are these walls you're talking about? And his uh, host pointed to his bodyguard of magnificent troops. He said, these are the walls of Sparta. Every man a brick. Now, here's the thing. As long as a brick lies by itself, it's useless. A single brick is useless. That brick only becomes useful when it's incorporated into a building. So it is with Christians. In isolation, there is nothing we can do. We can only be who we were created to be and to do the work that God's called us to do only in community. It's called the church of Jesus Christ. Only when we are woven into the fabric of the church can we be what God calls us to be, the called out ones, plural. Individualistic Christianity is an absurdity. It does not exist. We need the church for there is no church without us. Christianity is community. And then the second thing I want you to see about the nature of the church. Who is she? Peter tells us that we are a royal priesthood. Now, as Pastor Brad taught us last week, priest is a person who has access to God and whose task it is to bring others to God. The Latin word for priest is pontifex which means bridge builder. The priest is someone who builds a bridge for others to come to God. The priest has the privilege of bringing others to the Savior whom they themselves have found and love. 
The church is to bring others to God by telling forth the excellencies of God. The church is to declare the mighty acts of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. The church is to witness to others concerning the mighty acts of God, but they, not only by words, but through their lives, demonstrating to others what God has done for them in Jesus Christ. And in fact, Jesus says the same thing in Matthew 5, 16. Let your light so shine before others so that when they see your good works, they will glorify the Father who is in heaven. The church functions as a bridge between God and the world. And we bring God to the people who are desperately seeking purpose and meaning. And we are the ones who introduce God to a people who are living in darkness, who are seeking light. Now, what are we to bear witness to? We bear witness to the reality that God has called Christians out of darkness into his glorious light. And when we come to know Jesus, we come to know God. We no longer need to guess our way into seeing what works with our relationship with God. When we come to know Jesus, we come to know God. Jesus declares in John chapter 14, verse 9, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. So when we come to know Jesus, we come to know a standard by which all actions and motives may be tested. And when we come to know Jesus, we come to know the way, the truth, and the life. In Jesus, the way we are to live becomes clear. And when we come to know Jesus, we come to know power to serve him. It would be little use to know the way that we are to live and yet be helpless to live according to that way. In Jesus, there is both the way. He, he shows us the way. And then Jesus is the power that allows us to live according to his way. Now, here's... Here's how it works. You see, in life, there's multiple ways to live, multiple uh, directions, headings, compass headings that you can choose to organize and prioritize your life. You can prioritize success, and many do. And because of success, that means there are certain things you're not going to do and certain things that you will do, certain things that you will compromise on and certain things you won't because success is your goal. Or you can make financial gain, money, possessions, and wealth your goal. You can take fame and make that your goal. You can take education, family, whatever it is. There are so many ways that you can choose. Out of the myriad of ways that people can choose, when we receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, our way becomes crystal clear. When we receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, there is only one road which we can live by. And that road is called Obedience Avenue. There's only one, one road we're going to take. There's a, out of all those myriad of ways that we can prioritize and structure our lives, when we become Christians, there's only one way. And it's called Obedience Avenue. You know, Jesus says in Matthew 7, verses 13 through 14, enter through the narrow way. For the gate is wide and the road is easy. That leads to destruction. There are many who take it. But the way is narrow and the road is hard. That leads to life. There are only a few who find it. That narrow way that Jesus is talking about is Obedience Avenue. A life of obedience to the word, the logos, is the only way for Christians. And so when we accept Christ and you're not ready to obey, you haven't received Christ as Lord. When we receive Jesus as Lord, that's the only pathway. That's the only standard by which we can live. So here are the takeaways. First is that Christianity is community. We live and practice faith and community. There is no individual Christians. We can only be Christians and live out that calling 
in a body called the Church of Jesus Christ. Second is that we are a royal priesthood. We are bridge builders, and this world desperately needs a bridge to God. The, the chasm is widening. People living in darkness are moving further away from the light. We need a bridge, and that's what the royal priesthood does. And we do this by declaring through our lives, not just our words, the mighty acts of him who called us out of his darkness, out of the darkness into his marvelous light. And when we do that, we Christians take the narrow road and it's called Obedience Avenue. Jesus shows us the way to live on Obedience Avenue and Jesus gives us the power to live an obedience avenue. A church, that's who we are. That's the nature of the church. We are community. We are bridge builders. And we have a way in which we live. It's called obedience. Let us pray. Dear God, we give you thanks for the opportunity to gather as a church. Thank you for sharing with us who we are, the nature of the church. We are a community of people a brick in isolation is useless it is only useful when it comes together with others to make a building so God help us to live and practice our faith and community even in the midst of this COVID-19 social distancing help us to practice community Christians are a royal priesthood bridge builders Oh God, our world desperately needs you. Help us to live in such a way, speak in such a way, and act in such a way that people see the pathway to God and to light and to salvation. And Lord, when we say yes to you, we choose to follow your way, the narrow way, Obedience Avenue. And you show us not only the way to live, but you give us the power to live when we abide in you. So God, may we do that. Hey friends, if you've never received Jesus as Lord and Savior, that's the way we begin this journey. And I want to give you that opportunity because that's the bridge. That's the way you cross the chasm between life and death is to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. You don't earn this. We can't make our way through this. We can only receive what Christ has already done for us on the cross. And so if you've never done so, I want to give you the opportunity. The way you do that is to say something like this in your own words. Jesus, forgive my sins. I receive you as Lord and Savior. And now I choose to follow you by living on the narrow way called Obedience Avenue. Thank you so much for saving my life. Thank you for giving me eternity. If you've said that prayer, the very first thing you need is community, the church. Let us know in the common cards, and we'll be in touch with you, and we want you to join one of the neighborhood groups and get involved in community, because in isolation, we won't ever be what God has called us to be. Now, for the rest of the church, church, we're supposed to be bridge builders. We are practicing community and we are choosing to obey each and every day. Thank you for being that church. Amen. All right. Thank you, Pastor James. Excellent sermon. Friends, uh, we are now given an opportunity to give, and one of the ways we do that is through our tithes and offerings, and, and again, we say this every week, but it's true. Uh, when the church is generous with her tithes, ministry happens, and where ministry happens, lives are changed. So we offer a bunch of ways to give. One, you can give electronically through both websites, lakewoodlittlechurch.com and lakewoodgrace.com. You can give electronically through the Lakewood Grace app. 
You can text L Grace Give to 77977. You can drop your tithes off at the church office at any time. Uh, but thank you for being generous, especially now. And ministry is happening. And we know that through your generosity, the gospel is being proclaimed. And where the gospel is proclaimed, eternity changes. So thank you. Uh, thank you for your generosity in the ways that you have given. Let's join now in another word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for the word proclaimed. We pray, God, that we are changed because of it. We pray, Lord, through our actions that you may be glorified. We pray, Lord, for those who are hesitant, who haven't made a decision yet, that, God, this would be the day where they bend a knee and declare that Jesus is their Lord. May that happen, God, to your glory. Father, we do lift up to you our country. We lift up to you her leaders and we ask for wisdom, for discernment. Lord, help us now. Father, we pray for a cure. We pray for a vaccine to come quickly. Lord, for the kids and the teachers who are preparing for an uncertain fall, God, that your presence would just be a calming balm at this point. Father, we lift up to you those who are hurting those who are feeling bouts of depression, those who are feeling bouts of uncertainty, those who are in physical pain. God, that you will have mercy, that you will show them that through their suffering, Lord, something greater is happening. We ask, though, though Lord, that if it be your will, you remove what ails them. Father, we trust you. You are good. And now we pray the prayer that you taught your disciples long ago, praying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as you have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. And all of God's people said, Amen. Thanks for tuning in, friends. We'll see you next week. Good morning, Lakewood Grace and Little Church. This is the Old Rugged Cross.